الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تلك الايام نداولها بين الناس سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم الله سبحانه وتعالى has created the world so that it moves in cycles and subhanallah actually if you look at the analogy of the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set up the solar system just within the universe it gives you a very uh, interesting way of looking at life so you have just let's say within one galaxy you have the sun and then around the sun you have various planets that rotate and with around those individual planets you have individual moons that rotate and actually there's just levels of rotation So, and you constantly see that these things all follow in their orbit, but they start at a point, they go all the way around, and then they come back to a point. So there's always a circular pattern throughout the entire universe. And actually, it's present in the macro universe, and it's also present in the micro universe. So if you study uh, atomic structure, right, they also talk about how these particles rotate around other particles. So in constantly throughout the universe, there's this continuous theme of rotation. and that's also present within the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man and within man's interaction with the environment as well for example for the last few days people have been waiting for the weather to improve right and everyone knows that the weather will improve even though it's a little bit cold in the beginning of may it's been a little bit unseasonably cold we can say but everybody has the idea that it's going to get better everyone knows it's going to get hot why because it comes right there's a there's a cycle there's a summer cycle then it goes to winter it gets cold in cold people know it's going to go back to summer and become hot so there's this constant cycle all right similarly in the day okay the sun just set so we know that it's night but everybody knows that the day is going to come we have that hope right that the day will come and that's constantly cycling so you have the day and then you have the night and then you have the day and you have the night okay then outside of that you have the year right the year cycles as we just spoke of and then even within this even within a cycle even within a human being's life there's a cycle for example they start at a point right they start at a point of inability which is birth they're not able to do much they need to be taken care of taken care of <laughs> and then what happens is they come to a point where they peak and then what happens they come all the way back back down to a point of inability so again they cycled back they started unable they peaked with some minimal ability although often we mistake ourselves to be extremely able at that time in our life but the reality is it's a very little ability and then what happens is we go all the way back around and we become elderly and we become un- unable again and then somebody ends up having to take care of us so here you see again there's just the same theme of everything going around in a circle now the deen is the exact same way it starts out strange it peaks and then it goes back to being strange. So you can actually think about it in the way that we think about the year. Okay, the year starts out cold. In January it's cold. All right, slowly 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 over time it peaks. All right, and then it becomes warm. June, July, August. And then over time we come all the way back to December it becomes cold again. So here you have this kind of arc, right? And then it goes in a big circle. <laughs> Now, the same thing within the deen, the same concept exists within the deen in two ways. One is that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala divided the umm into parts of the day. I don't know how many of you had the opportunity either last week or the week before, I'm losing track of time, but Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangera was here from California and he gave a talk uh, in Mecca Masjid for the ulama's uh, conference uh, concerning the responsibilities that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has placed on various communities in order to carry the load as we spoke about last week carry the load of raising his great name 
So we saw in that talk, he spoke about the famous hadith in which the Prophet them explained that the day had been divided into parts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned a group of people to work from Fajr until Dhuhr. Okay? And that from Fajr until Dhuhr, they were paid for their efforts. Right? And that's the uh, first community of believers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned a group of people to work from Dhuhr until Asr. Okay? And that's the second community. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned a group of people to work from Asr until Maghrib. And then that's the Muslim community. So the three major adiyan, the three major people of the book, each of them were commissioned at a different time period within the history of the universe. But here the history of the universe is actually being uh, compared to just the day. Right? So from Fajr until Dhuhr, from Dhuhr until Asr, and then from Asr until Maghrib. Now, in the same way, we find these peaks and troughs within our own life as well. Okay, one thing that's very interesting is that when it's cold, people feel like it's difficult to do anything. You see that people don't feel like doing as much. People have less energy. You see that people sleep earlier. If you just make an observation, all right, go outside, just go out to any park and you'll see people will be there and they'll be alive. So much energy. At this time at night, 9 o'clock, oh, people are out, people are talking, people are in the streets discussing with one another, neighbors are out talking, they're barbecuing, they have so much energy. Now you go out 9 o'clock at night in winter, and the place is like a graveyard. The whole community becomes like a graveyard. Why? People become energetic, so much so, that what do they do? The entire community in this particular uh, region of the world, they decided that they were going to flip their clocks ahead of an hour. Right, so what do they have? Daylight savings time. What does that mean? It means that they're going to increase the amount of daylight in the summer because there's much more energy available in the summer for people. So what do they do? They increase the amount of time so that they can spend that time in, in activities with, with the sun shining down on them. So again, it's the same principle. Now, that same principle of this arc, right, of this curve, actually exists in the life of a Muslim as well. All right, there will be times when you will feel lazy. Every one of us goes through that time. You don't feel like doing much. You question yourself. You might even question your faith. You question your effort. You question your ability. That's part of life. It's part of the cycle. Everyone goes through it. And there will be other times that you feel so energetic. Right? You think that there is nothing else. I'm going to devote myself 100%. This is what I want to do. And that's also part of life, right? So what you have to recognize is that this is all just part of a cycle. Now, one of the common questions people bring up is that they feel that they're dis becoming distant from Allah despite the fact that they're continuously making effort. And then they wonder why. So actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed that a believer be in one of two states at any given point. Sometimes, now this is for the person who's sincerely making an effort. So you're regularly making an effort, you're regularly doing your dhikr, you're uh, trying to avoid the haram, you're inculcating the halal, you're trying to walk in the path of the sunnah and following the sharia. That individual will be in one of two states. Either that individual will be feeling as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raining the barakah of experience upon them. So what does that mean? It means when they pray, they feel that chill go down their spine. Every interaction that they have, they feel like it's the most unique interaction and they're totally into it. They're 100% in tune with everything. And that's a natural state. That's one of the great blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And an individual has to take advantage of that state. Make that very clear. Look what people do here. When it comes summer, they switch the clock forward an hour. Why? Because they say, we need to take advantage of this time. People are energetic. People want to be out. The weather is nice. Let's take maximum advantage of this time, so much so that they flip the whole clock one hour. Imagine the complexity involved. All the computers have to be flipped an hour forward. All the businesses have to, be, have to take this into account. The entire world actually has to take that into account because of this global village issue. So what they do is they flip their clock forward an hour to take advantage of that time when they're most energetic. So in the same way, the mu'min, when they're in that state, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showering that special mercy upon them, they need to take advantage of it. That's the time to increase one's zikr. Alright? That's the time to increase one's interaction, to increase one's interaction with the Quran, to increase one's learning, etc. Alright. Now, the other aspect then comes is that sometimes the sun also sets. Sometimes the winter comes. So what does an individual have to recognize then? Two things. Number one, that summer is near. All right? That summer is near and that slowly and eventually that state will return because that's the circular way by which we go through life. And number two, they actually have to recognize that to be a test and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what ends up happening is that when an individual gets close to Allah, they begin to experience this deen in a very unique way. It's a very, very unique experience. And once anybody has experienced it, they will trade the whole world to experience it again. That's the way the deen is designed. That's the power. Actually, all of this design, this mind, it was all designed to think about the great blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon the individual. Now, when the mind figures that out and then begins to process life in that way, it goes into an ecstasy that's beyond anything that anyone can ever describe in words. Okay, these nerves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created within a human being, yes, they tell us when we touch something that it's hot, when we touch something else that it's cold, but actually they were designed to interact with the environment as a mechanism to remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when those nerves fire, in the remembrance of Allah, a person gets into sajda, Okay, and then all of their nerves are basically reminding them. That position is just pushing them into the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when that body has become submissive to Allah. The heart was also designed to love. It can love many things. But when it falls in love with Allah, okay, and then it learns to appreciate how Allah loves it, then it's ecstasy beyond ecstasy. Okay, now that's one state of the believer. Where the entire body, the mind, the heart, the soul, everything is totally in concert with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance. And that is a great blessing, and when that comes upon a believer, they should maximize on that state. Now the opposite also exists. Actually, it's a res- what ends up happening is that now, when a bl- initially, this happens to most people, that they go into this state. And when they're in this state, they are constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what happens is slowly it gets taken away. Now when it gets taken away, actually there is a test that's occurring. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually testing the individual on is whether they worship their feelings or do they worship Allah. You understand? Okay, so for example, you're regular in your salah, you're regular in your adhkar, you're regular in your sacrifice for the deen and you're practicing the sunnah, etc., living according to the sharia. Now, if you're regular in all of these things, and then you feel that there's a period of time when you don't experience your salah. Okay, now you're praying and you're saying, I'm in prayer, but I'm not experiencing that depth. I'm doing my dhikr, but I'm not experiencing that depth. I'm sacrificing on all these different, uh, on all these different levels, and I'm not tasting what I should, what I think, what I used to taste before. Actually, that state is also a blessing. And actually, we call that a test because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing the servant. Were you worshipping the feelings or were you worshipping Allah? Right? The individual who only worships when they have those feelings, they're not worshipping Allah. They're worshipping feelings. The purpose was not to worship the feeling. The purpose was to worship Allah. Right? So what ends up happening is that then people start to replace Ibadah of Allah with other things that create feelings. Right? So then what happens is they need music. Right? So then somebody, they, somebody initially gets involved in the deen. They get, start tasting the deen. They get very excited about the deen. They're feeling all these great things about the deen. Okay, then all of a sudden those feelings disappear. Now they say that I am not really feeling anything. So then they start getting into these other types of modes of trying to feel things. So what do they go? They go towards music. Okay? Then they go towards music and they say, when I listen to this song about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I really feel like I'm into it. Okay, but then when I'm in prayer, I don't feel anything. Actually, the issue becomes there that shaitan takes an individual and convinces them that the feelings were more important than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Actually, it's Allah that we worship, not the feelings. So at times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uplifts those feelings in order to test salik, in order to test the person traveling on this path. Do you worship Allah or do you worship the feelings? SubhanAllah, actually the way our training is designed also takes this into account. For example, initially we tell the salik that they should spend time in muraqaba, spend time in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and all of that initial training develops a feeling. Okay? Then what happens is eventually one of the recommendations that arises is that the next dhikr that a person should focus on is La ilaha illallah. Now what happens with La ilaha illallah? All the feelings disappear. And the feelings disappear in order to show an individual that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. Even the feelings that are associated with worship of Allah are not worthy of worship. Only Allah is worthy of worship. Do you see the level there? This was the level that our scholars reached. This was the level that the people before us reached. They came to the point where they would recognize that even trying to seek those feelings was a means of worshipping something other than Allah. So they took that into account when they were training their students as well. Right? So it's very important that we recognize that when those states arise, right, those times of, let's say, it's not daylight or those times when it's not as energetic, right, that we continuously work with the effort that we have laid out. This is why I put such an emphasis when I speak to each of you, and the same that my teachers placed on me was that your, your schedule is the goal. Consistency is the goal. Now, one day you, you hear a talk, you get all excited, you increase your ibadah, okay, then the next day, you all of a sudden don't do anything for, you know, let's say another month. Then all of a sudden, you hear a talk, you get excited, you increase your ibadah. And then the question arises, were we worshipping the talk or were we worshipping Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present all seven days. The talk was to encourage us not to make, not to create a schedule which in the end does not lead to continuous remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the key thing is consistency. Not these spurts and then drops and spurts and drops. The whole goal is consistency. The individual who's consistent, they'll also become consistent in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually that is a step. Once an individual picks that up, that actually sometimes I won't experience something in my ibadah, that is then the, the door opens to just a whole new realm. Then that's when really a person begins to recognize what it means to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Right? And also that's when you begin to understand how sometimes in our history we find that people ended up doing things in order to seek the feeling. And that's why our Mashiach were very careful. Very careful. Any time they saw any student seeking feeling, seeking the emotion instead of seeking Allah, they were very quick to reprimand them. Very, very quick to reprimand them. So remember that our goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With feelings, without feelings, it doesn't make a difference. Basically, look, last week we spoke about this whole issue of this, these shoulders being designed to carry burden. Right? Now, the other thing you have to recognize about that whole talk was that these shoulders are designed to carry burden, right? And the analogy was that the farmer places a burden on the back of the cow, and the cow or the animal simply lowers their neck and carries that burden, and that animal is called a Muslim, right? That animal is called submissive to their master. Now, that animal doesn't tell the master what load to place on the shoulder. The animal does not make that distinction. The master makes that designation. The master decides that I will place this load on this animal, I'll place that load on the other animal. So in the same way, we do not have the right to choose what burden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places on our shoulders. For some people, it's difficulty. For some people, it's ease. But even in that ease, there comes difficulty. The point is to always remain happy with the fact that Allah allows you to carry his burden. Because you know that you have to carry burden. The only question is, whose burden? Are you going to carry the burden of the dunya? Worrying about these petty things that exist in life. This person said this, and that person said that, and she did, and he did. Or are you going to carry the burden of Allah? Worrying about how to raise his name, how to teach other people to do so. Right? 
So now the question is, as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigns us the general category of carrying the burden of raising his name, we have no complaint. If Allah makes us the person who fixes the shoes in the masjid, that's fine. If Allah makes us the imam of the masjid, that's fine. But the whole point is that Allah should make us. It should be from Allah. And once it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's a blessing regardless of what it is. Regardless of what it is, we do not place restrictions on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes from us. And this is also a very commonly misunderstood issue. Often people have the desire, especially when they're young, they say, I want to gain knowledge. Right? I want to gain Islamic knowledge. I want to become a scholar. I want to go study abroad. But that's not for everybody. Believe me, it's not for everybody. Each individual is different. There will be some people who will go and study. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create the situation for them to study financially, with their family, etc. That they will carry one load. And there is even a greater load to be carried by the people who are behind that individual supporting them and, and allowing their work to proceed. And that's actually the greater load. And that's actually, in some ways, the more rewarded load. That's actually the most desirable load. To carry weight behind the scenes, nobody knows what's going on except you and Allah. That's actually the, that's where the desire lies. That's ecstasy, actually. The problem is when you're in the forefront, then Shaitan, because when you're in the forefront, yeah, you're in the forefront and then people look at you in the forefront, but the same way Shaitan sees you in the forefront. Now when there's a battle, who gets, who's the one who gets hit first? The soldier on the front line gets hit first, not the one in the back carrying the supplies. So in the same way, when Shaitan gets up and he wants to fire, he nails that person who's standing in the front first. The back people are protected. The front person is the one who's in, tr in trouble. So actually the desire is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us and he use us in whichever way he please. It's up to him. We're totally fine. If it means that he creates the opportunity for us to study, then fine. We become ulama. If it means that he creates the opportunity for us to support the masjid, to build the masjid, to do the plumbing of the masjid, to clean the masjid, to support the work of the ulama, then fine, fabiha. We're happy with it, but the point is it should come from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should load upon our shoulders whatever load he desires. And we happily do it. Okay? So that should be very clear as well, because that issue comes up often as well. So, basically two, ma two main points. Number one, to recognize that everything comes in cycles. You cannot be constantly in a state of fana, constantly in a state of, of experience. Sometimes you'll experience, sometimes you won't experience. When you're in a state of experience, run with it. Take full advantage of it. Put in as much time and effort as you can and build upon it and make it your firm ground. And when those days come when you're not in experience, fine. Continue to worship Allah with the same fervor. And recognize that actually it's Allah that you worship. And then, if you need that bit of encouragement, come in the company of those people who happen to be in the state of excitement at that time, who happen to be in the state of experience at that time, because that's where you get your encouragement from. That's what this is. We remind one another, right? You remind me, I remind you, each, other, each person reminds the other. And then together as a community, there's a group of people within the, there's a group of people within the, uh, gathering that are in that state of experience and there's another group of people that are seeking to get to that state of experience and then there's a third group of people that are far away from that but as a community we come together and then we create a certain level amongst us and as we improve, as we educate ourselves as we build ourselves, that whole level rises, the level of the community rises all together so that's the first point point. and the second point is just to remember that let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala burden us with whichever burden he so desires. There's no reason for us to try to decide. <clears throat> I learned this lesson the very hard way. Very hard way. In fact, I still remember very vividly that when I went to go study, not only was I worried about being able to go study, but then I was worried about exactly which books, exactly which teachers, exactly how my schedule would be. I was so concerned. I was so concerned and I was trying to make this fit and make that fit and create this schedule and set this up that way. And I still remember very vividly that one day I was driving and just things were just not working out the way I wanted them to. And I don't know, all of a sudden it hit me in my mind. 
Right? The thought just came into my mind that, look, why are you trying to force the car to go in a direction that it's not meant to go? It's much better to just be a passenger and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take this wherever he wants it to go. In the end, it's up to him. Then I just left it all. I just left it. To- I just put my hands up and just said, whatever I need to do, I'll do. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala work out things the way they work out. And they worked out. That's how, that's how things are designed. So always, it's very important to recognize that you should accept. Part of being Muslim is one, recognizing that you have to accept a burden on your shoulder. And then two, recognizing that you don't have a choice. Right? This was also the mistake that the kuffar made in Mecca. They, their issue wasn't that a prophet was sent. Their issue was, why was that man made the prophet? Right? That was one of their complaints. And so that creates, that, that was, they were here questioning the burden. They said, why was burden placed on his shoulder instead of his shoulder? So that was one of the excuses that arose within their mind. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to be among those who uh, continue, are continuously in his remembrance, whether or not there's experience and may he give us a tawfiq to be among those who to accept whatever burden he places upon our shoulder with happiness and to carry that burden, to fulfill that burden so that he may reward us with permanent with a permanent reward on the day of judgment. Wa akhirat awana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.